very much. Welcome. Tukton Dechen, I'm almost up to my one year anniversary now of being ordained. I've been um, an aspiring practicing Buddhist now for just over 30 years. Uh, my sister introduced me to the Dharma and at that time I really felt as though um, someone had provided a uh, key to happiness. I remember it was really quite a profound time and um, uh, studying with Geshe at the moment and doing the Bodhisattva's way of life really is, has been taking me back to those times and the uh, meditations that uh, really had a huge impact on my mind. Um, so fortunate to have uh, the Dharma available, you know, that the leisures and endowments all came to fruition for me and for you. It's, 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 it's amazing. It's fantastic. We are definitely at the pointy end of, um, of, uh, of, of, of being able to achieve happiness. We're, we're so fortunate and so far ahead of so many other people. Um, and, you know, I guess ultimately becoming ordained uh, was just a part of my journey and maybe one day your journey too, all out there. I really encourage you. Um, it's an opportunity to really practice Dharma um, in a full, complete way. You know, it's, it's, it's now my life. And um, I really encourage you all too, if the opportunity is right for you to also consider becoming ordained. Um, but that wasn't on my agenda for meditation today. But anyway, um, so yeah, so welcome. Welcome and um, thank you to Choki for uh, asking me to lead the morning meditations. I mean, as we all know, Venerable Choki does an amazing job around here, being, being the resident teacher and um, she really looks after us all. Uh, I know when I was in isolation back from Tibet, uh, not from Tibet, from India, I wish it was Tibet, um, but from India, she, you know, was, she, she came up on a regular basis and was my only form of contact and I really appreciated her kindness and her, her company. So um, thanks Choki for, Venerable Choki for asking me. Where am I going to put this? I'll put it down here. Okay, my notes. So, um, you know, as we know, the role of meditation is essential in getting uh, the Dharma from our head down to our heart. Um, without it, there isn't going to be a lot of change. Uh, so, you know, it's important that we hear the teachings. It's important that we reflect on it, but then it's essential that we meditate on it. So, um, and meditate again and again and again. And so that's what I'm going to do uh, today is to go over um, to, to stick to very traditional, to the very traditional meditations that are taught to us and the meditations that really have had an impact on my life and on my practice. And I'm sure you've heard these meditations and you've done them yourself, but here, let's, let, let's do it again and really see if we can uh, get those, um, those attitudes down into our hearts so we really begin to embody the Buddha's um, qualities, the Buddha's teachings. Right, so um, I started out with the prostrating of body, speech and mind. Uh, you know, I think whenever I, I prostrate, I always say that with my body, speech and mind, I prostrate, offer and go for refuge. So that way we're using our three doors. Um, it's always good to use the three doors when taking refuge uh, and, 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 and practice using our body, speech and mind. So let's just do some breath awareness, just to settle down, settle, my, settle our mind, settle my mind. And I always like doing the um, nine round, uh, nine round meditation. So um, let's do that. You don't have to actually physically do it, but I find um, for the first few times, it helps just to get into the feel of what you're doing. So breathing in through the left, right down to your abdomen. 
out to the right. In through the left, opening the left nostril up. They are out through the right. In through the left. Out through the right. In through the right. Out through the left. In through the right. Out through the left. In through the right. Out through the left. In through both nostrils. And out. So these are nice, deep, long breaths that you're taking. Let's do it again. I just put my hand up here just to stabilize and going backwards and forwards like that. So in through the left. Three times and out three times. Now the right, the other side. Now both nostrils in and out. Now do the nine round again. And you can use your hand to block the nostrils or you can just um, visualize that's what's happening. Now that you've got the feel of the sensation of the nose and the air. So three times right, left, and all, all together, both nostrils.
And when you're finished with the nine rounds, just um, relax, be in the moment. Just be aware of any sensations in your body or just be aware of your breath. So I and all transmigrating beings. What does this mean? Myself, transmigrating beings. That I, me, and all beings in all realms. So just try and get a sense of that. Try and visualize it. All everybody in this realm, all the animals, all the preterists, all the Naraks in the hell realms, all the gods in the god realms. I and all transmigrating beings in your mind's eye, everyone. Really expanding your refuge and who, who is taking refuge. Take refuge. Why are we all taking refuge? Because as Venerable Gautso puts it, life sucks. So much suffering. So much dissatisfaction. We need protection. We don't have the skills or the knowledge to save ourselves. Everything that we've already done, apart from studying Dharma, has not helped us at all ends up being more cause for suffering. Another aspect of refuge is, is renunciation. The flip side. We know we don't have the answers. We're fed up, just sort of wandering around, lost. You want to find, we want to take refuge, you want to be protected by, by someone and some knowledge that will help us to be a more happier, stable and helpful person. Another aspect of refuge is humility. Just I I accepting that I don't have the answers, but there are others out there that do. And that's who I take refuge in.
guess from being ordained, these, these robes are a type of refuge, are a type of protection. Always reminding me of the path that I've chosen, the Buddha Dharma. Our refuge vow also reminds us of that too. We take refuge in the Buddha, the Dharma, and the Sangha, and ultimately in the Guru. So let's just unpackage that a bit. Taking refuge in the Buddha, the Buddha, the Buddhas, which you can see symbols of the Buddhas behind me, the form of Tara, form of Chenrezig, form of Lama Sankapa. The Buddha is like the is is like the is the source. It's the source of the teachings. It's like uh, the analogy that they use is um, you know he's like the doctor. The Buddha Shakyamuni, the first um, a wheel turning Buddha, wheel turning because he he showed us in um, in a mundane form, in a body form, on how, how how to do it, how how to become a Buddha. So he, even though he was enlightened, he showed the aspect of, a, of an ordinary person. I mean, this is what Buddhas do. And I was, I was reading the other day and um, found this list, the attitudes of the Buddha. So let me just read through them slowly and you can just contemplate each one why the Buddha is just such a profound refuge. The Buddha knows without doubt the positive and negative effects of virtuous and non-virtuous karma. He knows all possibilities and the truth of his statements are undeniable. Buddha knows the consequences of a specific cause action as well as any relation between a cause and its effect. There is no question that Buddha couldn't answer. There is no question that Buddha couldn't answer accurately and appropriately. Buddha knows the various attitudes and dispositions of each individual and what their inclinations are. If you're a Hinayana or Mahayana or neither, he knows that. Buddha knows the inclination of each individual and gives teachings accordingly. The Buddha knows the ability of each individual and offers teachings in a concise form for higher capacity and a detailed and expansive form for lower ability. Buddha knows all paths and their respective causes causes for liberation, a good rebirth, etc. Buddha knows all dharma, all phenomena to be abandoned and the dharmas to be sought after. Buddha knows all former lives. Buddha knows the transmigration of all beings in the universe in detail. Buddha knows the extinctions of all forms of contamination. So from that list, the Buddha is all-knowing, omniscient, omnipresent. And 
and he became a Buddha through a lot of effort, a lot of hard work through the Dharma. I mean, the Buddha taught the Dharma. He taught the steps that brought him to omniscience, to full enlightenment. So they often say that the Dharma is the actual true refuge because that is the steps, that's the pathway, that's the medicine. And we have the complete Dharma, we have all the steps. Of the Mahayana tradition, the great scope The Dharma that requires the most courage to practice. We're not only doing it for ourselves, we're doing it for all sentient beings. And the Dharma shows us how we can do this. Reflecting and meditating. Teachings. Here at Chen Rezik, it's like a fountain of Dharma. We've got a fantastic teachers, Dharma teachings. That is the true refuge. And then the Sangha, the spiritual community. I think traditionally the Sangha was ordained people. And I think the people that became ordained back in the Buddhist time, there were so many more. And the same with Tibet. You know, a good percentage of the, po significant percentage of the population were ordained. But that's not the case in the West. So I think we can include the Sangha to be the spiritual community, the thousand armed Chen Rezik community, the FPMT community, that's a Sangha, so fortunate to have this community around us, they create the environment, our friends who encourage us and support us along the way, we'd be lost without them picking us up when we've lost our way giving us opportunities to practice when they annoy us. You know, I've, I've been really enjoying listening to Lama Zopa's teachings and when he says, when he, um, at the very beginning, all oh, my dear, dear mothers, all my dear beings, all my um, precious jewels, he refers to us all as. Because... Uh, we provide an opportunity for him to practice. I mean, I think that's, that's not true. He's just providing us an example of how the Sangha community, how being, uh, having a perfect human rebirth with leisure's endowments gives us the opportunity to practice and that everyone we meet are like precious jewels providing opportunities to practice. A sangha, a spiritual community, essential part of refuge. And then the guru, the guru, the precious guru, or a guru who teaches us, gurus like Geshe Sultram, Lama Zopa, Geshe Zopa. I was so fortunate in FPMT to have the teachers, the gurus that we have. So blessed, Lama Zopa, where he has introduced um, really realized beings to come and teach us, Kurdi Sanjib, Lama Lundrup, Choden Rinpoche, Sokong Rinpoche, 
Ling Rinpoche, oh my gosh, we are so blessed with all these Buddhas, gurus, who we get the opportunity to receive teachings from. His Holiness, the Dalai Lama, oh my gosh, ultimate refuge. You know, they, they were saying, um, wasn't it yesterday in teachings, I can't remember, but I did hear it yesterday, that Kadrala, when she, she, when she looks at His Holiness, the Dalai Lama, she sees thousand-armed Chen Rezik. I mean, we are so fortunate to have Kadrala as a part of our refuge field, a living female Buddha, no doubt in my mind. No doubt. And I, th I think this is the, 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 the guru, you know, they're, they're, they're the living representation of our refuge, of the Buddha. The guru is the Buddha, Dharma and Sangha. The more we are able to give ourselves over to the guru, the more in touch we, can't, we become with our own Buddha nature. As hard as this may be, it was hard for me. It took me many years, many years before I was able to really um, embrace guru devotion. I think because in the West, you know, the rights of the individual, important to think for ourselves. These were attitudes I was brought up with. And when you have take on guru devotion, <coughs> It's not about yourself anymore. It's about pleasing the guru. It's about doing as the guru instructs us to. These teachings from Geshe Sultram, the instructions we're receiving, so fortunate, so fortunate. May my refuge be as strong as a Vajra. May my refuge be as strong as a Vajra, inseparable forever. We read this daily in the Guru Puja every morning and it really popped out at me this morning. I'd be like a Vajra, inseparable forever. The Vajra, you see, um, I don't have a Vajra here, but I'm sure you all know what a Vajra look like. This is a symbol for compassion. It's also a very strong symbol too. You know, when we... May I be like a Vajra inseparable forever. May my refuge be like this. And that of all transmigrating beings who are also taking refuge with me. I dedicate the merit generated by myself and others to the great enlightenment. May the supreme jewel of bodhicitta that has not arisen arise and grow 
and may that which has arisen not diminish but increase more and more. May the supreme jewel of the wisdom understanding emptiness that has not arisen arise and grow. And may that which has arisen not diminish but increase more and more. In the land encircled by the snowy mountains, you are the source of all happiness and good. Chen Rezik, Tenzin Gyatso, please remain until samsara ends. You who uphold the subduer's moral way, who serve as the compassionate master of, all, of us all. Who is the teacher <coughs> of Manjushu, the teacher of the Manjanath. Who write magnificent prayers honoring the three jewels, savior of myself and others. Your disciples, please, please live long. There we go. Sorry about that. I got a bit starstruck with Lama Zopa's prayer. I'm sorry, Lama Zopa. You are Paul Subdue's moral way who serve as the bountiful fair of all serving. And oh my gosh, normally just rolls off my tongue. Anyway, thank you so much. I hope you got something out of this meditation this morning. Um, and uh, I'll be back tomorrow. <laughs>